Hello, I'm Marcia Cavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, one of the largest new construction projects in the country is now in an advanced stage locally, and the landscape changes almost weekly. We'll take a look tonight at the upcoming medical center and how it will change the city. There have been some changes in the administration of library contributions in response to an ongoing investigation. We'll discuss that, plus the legislature heading for its final month in session. New hope for the Piazza d'Italia, a change on the bench for the Pelicans, and the latest on this fall's elections. Running with us are tonight's informed sources. Errol Aboard, producer of informed sources. Jeremy Alford, publisher, lawpolitics.com. Catherine Sayer, reporter, nola.com, the Times-Picayune. And David Hammer, reporter, WWL-TV, Channel 4. First over to Jeremy, going into the final month of this session. A lot of action going on. Why don't you update us? Sure is. You know, for the past month, we've watched the House develop the budget, develop revenue and tax bills. And the focus is now shifting to the Senate. Uh, the House has sent over 11 revenue bills, including the cigarette tax, some uh, changes to the movie and solar program, and a number of other revenue measures. On Thursday, they're going to send over HB1, the House budget, the big budget, the $1.6 billion shortfall budget. And, uh, you know, the Senate's job is, is to take that and, and to, to try to, to balance it and, and add some revenue. The money bills that the House has already sent over amount to $615 million. Uh, finance Chairman Senator Jack Donahue told me his goal is to come up with $948 million. So mm -hmm. obviously there's a gap mm -hmm. there. What are they going to do? Well, on Monday, uh, Revenue and Fiscal Affairs is going to hear those 11 revenue bills from the House. Uh, the Chairman, Neil Reiser, told me that he's going to look at the movie program, the solar program, and the cigarette tax for more money for starters. But the Senate is still waiting for a few key measures to come over from the from the House, you know, to stay within Governor Bobby Jindal's revenue neutral rule, which is that forever, whatever amount they raise in taxes and revenue, they have to go in the budget and offset it with adductions of an equal amount. Well, right now, the only thing that's moving to provide that cover is a slight rollback in the inventory tax credit. Next week, you're going to see move a repeal or a phase out of the corporate franchise tax, <clears throat> with, which business would love. Mm -hmm. And House members are already under attack because this business community feels like all the taxes they have passed are against them, so they feel like moving this repeal gets them back in the good graces with business. But also, there's also another piece of legislation by Representative Kirk Talbot that targets uh, dedications in the general fund. There's going to be a, a large amendment to that bill. They're going to target 20, a 20% 20 cut for one year on those general fund dedications. Uh, that equals, uh, they'll get about 20% of the $600 million unless they have to back some other things out. Uh, but, but it is moving, moving to the Senate. You know, the last few months we've seen Speaker Chuck Cleckley, uh, Appropriations Chairman Jim Fannin, and Ways and Means Chairman Joel Robito, all term limited, all very soft-spoken, very deliberate. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving to Senate President John Alario and Revenue and Fist Chairman Neil Reiser and Finance Chair Jack Donahue. These are all folks who are running for re-election again. They all, there's a touch more bravado on the Senate side. So, you know, it's interesting that there's going to be some, uh, I think, some, some very uh, hard negotiations on the Senate side. When I spoke with Neil Reiser in his office, I was surprised to see a, a large uh, bear rug on the wall and another larger bear rug on the sofa. And he, he loved telling me how we killed both of them. <laughs> so it's, you know, there's a little bit more John Wayne on the Senate <laughs> side. So I think there's some more twists and turns to come. And what are we hearing from the administration about what is progressing so far through, through the House and through the Senate so far? Well, Bobby Jindal's been surprisingly <clears throat> quiet. I think he's willing to let lawmakers try to figure it out. Uh, he's only asked them two things. Number one, to give him a budget that incre does not have a net increase in taxes. And number two, a budget that is revenue neutral. As long as the governor gets those two things, he'll go around the country after he announces for president, presumably in June, uh, declaring victory on the budget. Is the solar tax credit potentially going to be taken away entirely ahead of the sunset in 2017? Right. It's, it's, it's already scheduled to be taken off of the books, but it looks like uh, there's, there's going to be a little more of an aggressive mood, move to scale it back on the Senate side. How much? Uh, we'll have to wait till Monday. To because I know they already did it with the leasing. Yeah. Turns out was what came out of the committee or already passed, I guess. Yeah. But the, to get rid of it entirely would 
potentially, you know, with no no run up or no notice would be interesting for a lot of homeowners who may have planned to do something before 2017. Yeah. Well, lawmakers have a big revenue hole to fill and there's a real appetite for making some changes to movie and solar. Yeah. Something on both sides of the environmental perspective here, doing away with solar tax, increasing the tax on smoking. <laughs> yeah, one for the other. And so far, what has passed has left higher education unscathed, but health care would take a hit. So that's really not going to be satisfactory either. I mean, what's going to be done to satisfy that? Right. The, the bill I spoke about earlier from Representative Kurt Talbot, that would be uh, where they would target a 20% cut in certain general fund dedications. Uh, you know, that's something that both sides of the aisle likes. Republicans like it because they feel that that's one of their areas they targeted for budget reforms that they just couldn't get moved in the session. And Democrats like it because they want to find money for health care. Yeah. So a, a couple of other things, just kind of quickly if you can touch on them. I, I know Common Core came up and supposedly, as Stephanie Grayson in her column today said, they were kumbayaing with it, everybody <laughs> hand-holding. Is really, has a com compromise been reached? Uh, it, you know, it certainly sounds like it, although I think everyone who's involved, all the stakeholders and players, are holding their breath a little bit to see, you know, if the other shoe is going to drop and what mm -hmm. happens next. But basically, calls for a wholesale review of the Common Core program, and it allows the governor and legislature to give a thumbs up or thumbs down. The rub is, is the next governor. It's not yeah. Bobby Jindal. Uh, some other things that that we saw uh, move this week. Uh, we also saw actually not move was the Paycheck Protection Bill, mm -hmm. which where the union should be able to deduct their. Uh, union dues out of public payroll. That was supposed to come up for a vote this week. It, it did not. It's one of the, the most lobbyist issues of the session. Uh, lawmakers do not want to vote for this. The committee members who did vote for it already have opponents lined up to run against them in the fall from the police unions. On Tuesday, we're going to see the Re Religious Freedom Bill, which I think got as much attention as the budget did in mm -hmm. the first week, weeks of the session. So uh, th there's still some, some high profile issues moving uh, aside from the budget and taxes. And then locally also, um, there was a bill to uh, by Jeff Arnold to incorporate Algiers. I mean, this has a way to go. And ultimately, if it would come out of the legislature, the session would go to a vote of the people. Right. But it, or, or Algiers would stay in Orleans Parish, but it would incorporate be incorporated right. with this proposal. OK, let's move away from legislature now and talk about library and library F foundation. And the story that you broke last week has really just caused a firestorm of controversy. Um, that's all the talk of the town, and you've been reporting on the developments just since last Friday that were happening at a rapid pace. Yeah, I, I, I've never seen, I don't think, such a swift and uh, expansive response to any of my stories over the years, anything involving the Ray Nagin investigation, Deepwater Horizon, Road Home. I mean, those were things that got a lot of public response, but not so quickly and so powerfully. And, uh, you know, just since last Friday's show, you had the mayor weighing in. He was very upset about what I found and uh, And, and recap for, quickly what you found, too, in case well, somebody is not aware. I found that um, the Library Foundation with uh, Irvin Mayfield, the jazz trumpeter, Grammy winner, uh, and his longtime friend Ronald Markham uh, on the board and in charge of the board had decided, uh, starting in 2012, to give uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, which pays their salaries, each of them making six-figure salaries from that institution. It was actually founded by Irvin Mayfield. And it is also a nonprofit, and their big project was to build a jazz market, which is a bar and uh, jazz club, and it also has space that will be dedicated to library-like services uh, and public services, and it's in on Aretha Castle Haley Boulevard in Central City. And, uh, you know, their their vision was that they were going to be creating kind of like a jazz library. And but uh, the library foundation had a charge to only support the library system. And they made a change in the rules uh, governing that or they tried to in 2012. Something that I've discovered more recently is that that was never actually filed with the secretary of state until 2014, which calls into question even more some of the payments that were made starting in 2012. 2012, but the upshot is that in 2012 and 2013, you had almost $900,000 that went from one organization that they represented to another that where they actually benefited. And as you said, the mayor didn't like this at all. So what did he call for? So he called for a complete split of the two boards, which had some overlap of membership. He also called for the money to be paid back. Most 
importantly for anything that was not spent on library services for the city. And the this week, the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra Board, which is headed by Ron Foreman from the Audubon Institute, uh, agreed uh, to pay the money back in full, whatever that amount might be. We know it's at least $863,000 from public filings. It appears that there may be at least another 20000 just by mid-2014 that was paid, and uh, they're going to have an accounting to figure out exactly how much that is. But uh, just last night, I uh, brought forth some additional issues, which is that we have a federal investigation ongoing, subpoenas have been served, and uh, you know the feds are looking at this for various legal issues, and we had some legal experts looking at how nonprofits often can kind of cross this line and get into both civil and potential criminal violations. Any state potential criminal violations? Any state investigation going on? Well, there's no confirmation of a state investigation, but we do know that there are state nonprofit laws that require uh, certain things re regarding solicitation of funds. Um, they uh, also um, deal with there was a there was a case actually involving the New Orleans Opera Association after Katrina where the uh, board members changed the focus of that organization to try to support a southern regional opera without the okay of the people who created the foundation and the people who gave donations to it and that was followed up in state court and they made the money get uh, be paid back. So why has this touched such a nerve? What are you being told? Well, I think it has to do with the fact that, you know, Mayfield was named as the cultural ambassador for the city of New Orleans by former Mayor Ray Nagin in 2002. And he holds a position of prominence, and he was entrusted with some very important roles, including head of the library system itself, not the foundation, but the system after Katrina. And, you know, he has this Elysian trumpet that was a gift to the city that he's the uh, curator, you know, holder of, and he plays it. And he, um, I think people feel that this was a breach of his not only fiduciary duties, but maybe in a more kind of moral sense, his representation of the city of New Orleans. Any comment from him yet? No, he's in fact uh, avoided us uh, at all costs, and we've tried to track him down, and he's been ushered out back doors and such like, uh, like that, so that we haven't been able to talk to him. But Nojo says these monies really were well spent. The, Nojo says that we were as operating essentially as a satellite library, mm -hmm. or we're going to once we get that up and running. Have you heard anything from the music community, from other musicians? Or? Yes, um, I have, and I haven't you know, developed all of that yet for a report, but I'll be coming out with some more stuff. Uh, definitely, there's anger in the community because Mayfield also did a lot of fundraising work after Katrina that was supposed to support musicians and I think you know a lot of them were given jobs by him but others have complained that they, that, that this was a, again a breach of their trust in him. So we'll continue to hear more reporting on this from you. Yes. Okay thanks a lot David. Catherine over to you. Now our, our big new medical corridor you just did a piece about it particularly looking at the University Medical Center what have you learned? Well, yeah, you can drive by that new hospital complex in Mid-City right now and just see that whole campus really taking shape and really coming to life. You have the $1.1 billion University Medical Center um, scheduled to open later this year, and then you've got the nearly billion dollar Veterans Affairs Hospital right next door. That's expected to serve 70,000 vets in the Gulf Coast region. And so, you know, as, as these hospitals near near opening, I think a lot of people are saying, okay, well, what what impact are these hospitals really going to have? You know, are they going to be entities unto themselves, or is there going to be a larger, you know, uh, ripple into the economy? And that was a major uh, question at a recent conference at University of New Orleans, and actually a senior vice president with LCMC Health, the private operator for University Medical Center, he talked about... Um, a vision for the hospital becoming a, a destination for health care. And the, the way that they would do that is through pursuing certain specialties. So some of the proposals he came up with were a burn unit, ear, nose, and throat. Um, neurosciences, which is just a huge demand for neurosciences. Mm -hmm. He talked about uh, a specialty in um, Parkinson's disease treatment, as well as cancer, focusing on, on new technology. Mm -hmm. 
And so, um, of course, we're, we're hoping to bring patients here and also to keep our, our own here instead of going to Houston and, and to Birmingham for, for specialty care. Mm -hmm. But how do they see this whole medical corridor now impacting not just the immediate neighborhoods around it, but stuff radiating out from it too? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think a lot of that has yet to be determined, but we're starting to see some of the evidence that it is affecting um, the whole biomedical corridor. On the real estate side, I, I wrote recently about um, a developer wanting to convert an old five-story office building on Canal Street directly across from the hospitals into a European boutique style hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to add two floors to it. He needs some city approval. So in his pitch to the city, he specifically said he's targeting um, you know, hospital visitors and even that he would have some sort of a discount program for veterans and their families who could prove need. Um, and that's a building that's been vacant since Katrina. I see. And, and you can see it just by driving down Tulane Avenue. Yeah. I mean, you can be blocks away from the hospital complex, and you can see the impact that, of new activity. And then even beyond that, Bank Street, um, beyond Bank Street, there's a lot of new development. So a lot of people know what's going on, and a lot of people are just getting ready to jump in on this. Absolutely. And that's one of the things, too, about moving it out of downtown, these medical services, is that the ancillary services have room to develop and economic development created by that, which you wouldn't have had the opportunity to do just in the downtown setup. Right. Um, so the medical center, um, the university medical center, is slated for opening this summer, right? In August, yeah. In August. That's really very, very exciting. It, it definitely is. And like you said, when you first started uh, discussing this, if you haven't driven down that corridor, if you haven't gone down Tulane or Canal in a while, you're in for a change there. I mean, it's a startling change. It's pretty amazing to see. It's a really a whole different landscape down there. There's some, there are some buildings that people will recognize all their lives, like the, the Dixie Brewing building, which was really derelict. And uh, they've the torn Pan down the, 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 yeah. the Pan Am building. I think those two, most people would recognize in a boat in bad condition. Look at them now. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dixie building, they've, they've torn down all the warehouses, so it's just the main building right now. And I think that's going to be part of the, uh, of the VA complex. Mm -hmm. And then the Pan American building. I mean, a lot of them is new construction, but there are some buildings that you'll recognize from before. And thank goodness that they saved those buildings too. And so I think that's important. Oh, yeah, thing. absolutely. Yeah, I think that was a real important thing. It was very important to the neighborhood. Yeah. And there's a commercial real estate component to the hospital complex. UMC is going to have more than 28,000 square feet of retail space. They'll be leasing out. Um, so that'll be its own economic uh, spark there. They've gotten interest from daycares, um, cafes, restaurants, uniform shops. So you know, the kinds of things you might expect um, to service the patients and the visitors and the doctors. Is that burn unit for sure? That's definitely happening. That was just one of the possibilities that he brought up. Because that would be so. Because right now mm -hmm. it, the closest one is Baton, Baton Rouge, Rouge, right? Right. That would be big. I think that's, there that's used the to idea. be one at West Jefferson, uh, which made sense for offshore oil. And for some reason, they closed the burning unit there, which seemed like the most logical place. And so Baton Rouge is the only place right now. Yeah. So yeah, there needs to be one in this area. Well, we certainly wish it all the success. It's a really big part of our economic development, but also for health care in this region. Oh, well, um, I think it's the biggest story in New Orleans now, I mean, for the foreseeable future, because it's day by day, you don't feel the impact of it. But one day when people look back at this period of time in New Orleans, they're going to say that was an enormous um, story right there. Already just such a big physical change in that quarter. Thanks a lot, Catherine. All righty. Piazza d'Italia, Errol. Um, it's been there since the 70s and uh, not everybody knows it's there. Since 1978. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. The, uh, the city with the cooperation of groups like the Italian American Federation, they, they developed this uh, this area. A lot of you may know there's been right next to the Lowe's Hotel downstairs, uh, uh, downtown by Lafayette and Common. And they built a beautiful fountain and backdrop. And I think we have a, an illustration of it. And at the time, this was heralded as one of the most important pieces of architecture in the country. It's, uh, it's neoclassical architecture. A guy named uh, Charles Moore who was a nasty renowned architect. You can't see it fully, but it, the fountain is actually a map, a map of Italy. And then, it, and then it spans out. And then beyond that, uh, it, uh, with like the uh, the celebration space. Now it's two parking lots and there's not much activity uh, going to that. But in its day, and its day didn't last very long, a, a lot of these things have different colors. When this thing was fully lighted, it was really, really 
um, beautiful. And my, my understanding, that was the Likes building was originally built right next to it. And then when it was became a hotel, Lowe's Hotel was supposed to provide some of the maintenance. And I think they have, but just bare upkeep. But uh, a couple of years ago, there was a movement, sort of like a first phase, let's start fixing this mm -hmm. thing and bring it back. But this past week, the Landry administration has asked for proposals, kind of like what they did with the World Trade Center, asking people to uh, make some proposals, proposals for qualifications about what they can do to develop this area. And, you know, they want some retail. I think they like some residential. And Specifically in the parking lots. Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. Getting these two blocks of, of parking lots and make it into a, a very festive ground. In 78, I think part of the vision was, because in 78 people were still talking about there being a casino. And there was still a river gate. Yeah, I believe part of the vision was, well, you know, once you get this casino, people go and gamble, then they'll cross the street and get a cannoli and, and celebrate. Well, that's not how casinos operate. Casinos operate, and once you get in the casino, <laughs> you, don't leave, you, no. you, you, you stay. <laughs> but, then, but then again, Fulton developed as a way of getting some of the overflow from, mm -hmm. uh, from. It could be that even with the best of intentions, in 78, this place wasn't fully ready to develop, and maybe now it is. Now it is, Maybe yeah. now, uh, especially once that new hotel uh, comes in line at the, the World Trade Center, so it's going to be a Four Seasons. Now you've got more people living in the neighborhood. If it can really function as a town piazza like it does in, in Italy where people go for a walk at night and get an ice cream cone yeah, and, the, and sit you know, listen to and music. Outdoor seating, you yeah. know, outdoor cabins. It's you know. embarrassing though. You have Plaza de España on the riverfront and this and they were just comp it, nobody uses them. It well, the Piazza, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I think the Piazza uh, Espana is a good example, especially that fountain, because that fountain sat there for years and yeah, nobody knew yeah. what to do with it. Sometimes you get these things. It was a gift it, from the, the yeah, king of yeah. Spain or something. Sometimes you get these things in, in their head, in their head of their time. Yeah. I think that was. And I think the, for that fountain, its time is coming now. As they're developing the riverfront, and, and uh, as Riverwalk seems to have found the right formula, and again, once that hotel gets in place, I think that's going to start working. But it yeah. does happen. You get these things, and just everybody goes, "Yeah, we're glad to have it." Then nothing happens. Well, there's increasing activity, you know, foot traffic and everything downtown at, at, at all hours. So hopefully, the Piazza times, d'Italia eventually will be very well the, used. The, the times we'll, are better. There was also yeah. at the time to talk about a, a Lafayette corridor, which right. would, uh, you know, go from the Hyatt all the way across, and that never really yeah. developed either. So if they get the Lafayette corridor going, that might help also. Okay, yeah, well, thanks a lot. Jeremy, over to you. Let's find out quickly what's happening with our governor's race. All right, we're only five months away from the crown jewel of Louisiana elections, so we're going to start hearing more about the governor's election. But there was some big news this week. We saw a poll from Southern Media and Opinion Research that had David Vitter at 38%. Still show John Bell Edwards, state representative, uh, looking like he could get the second spot. But if you monkey around with the margin of error, it looks like Jay Darden, our lieutenant governor, is... is you know, maybe maybe in the running if he could pick up a boost. But I requested the cross tabs for this poll, and a cross tabs basically breaks down all the demos, ages, race, party, and David Vitter just dominates every single line item, mm -hmm. even the under thirty five demographic. So you know, you got to wonder exactly what Not females. Well, no, there's a there's a fifteen or sixteen point gender gap in every single different male to female breakdown for David Vitter, but mm -hmm. he does so well among white males that. You got to wonder if it if it even really matters. So, what what can take David Vitter off his game? Well, we all know there's the D.C. Madam controversy, and no one's really hit him really hard on that yet in this cycle. There's a new super PAC out called Gumbo PAC. It's run by Orso Baychak, a well-known Democratic consulting group in Baton Rouge, and they posted a video on their website. It links David Vitter to convicted lobbyist Jack Abramhoff, and of course, it brings up. Uh, the DC Madam scandal. Uh, the question is, can this super PAC raise money to get its message on TV? Because a uh, super PAC without money is like a spaceship without rocket fuel. And so what kind of impact really could that have, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of the partisan element of it, Republican and Democrat? I mean, could it just benefit some other Republican, or really not a Democratic candidate? Right. Well, you got to assume that if votes get knocked off of David Vitter because someone is attacking him, that it, there would be the two Republicans, Public Service Commissioner Scott Angel and Jay Darden, who would pick them up. But really, still, and we've talked about it before on the show, what to watch is whether another Democrat or an African American candidate gets in. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant General, uh, retired General Russell Honore mm -hmm. told me he's still interested. And I think there, there could be someone else too within the next couple of weeks. Okay, we'll be looking for that. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, we have a couple of minutes to talk Pelicans. And boy, there was a surprise move. Yeah, Monty Williams, who was a, a classy guy and a really uh, a very impressive guy. I just loved his 
the demeanor, but uh, was fired. He, he said he was surprised. He expected his contract uh, to be extended. And th there was obviously a little bit of conflict between he and Dell Dimps, who was the, uh, uh, who's the manager of the team. I think, I don't know for sure, I think the moment he lost his job, was in the playoff game against uh, the Warriors, that third game when the Pelicans had a lead into the last minute, and then they, they wound up losing yeah. the game. Well, they were ahead by 20 points. Yeah, yeah, yeah early in the game, they were way right? up, okay. Yeah, was and then to come back, and, and if they would have won one game in that series, I think people would have been pleased. Okay, they got in the playoffs, they won one game. And then to have blown that game, a lot of people were criticizing the coach, you know. Uh, and now basketball gets pretty complex in the last minute or so, and so it's hard to, it's hard to say. But a lot of people were very critical of him um, because of that. And, and had they won that game, I think it's, he, he might still be the coach. But if you look at the Clippers did the same thing last night, and nobody's talking about firing Doc Rivers. No. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 well, the, the, the players just, you know, wet the bed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's conflicts between the, between the manager and the coach. So the obvious question is, who's the new coach? No one knows. A name that keeps on coming up, though, is a guy named Tommy Thibodeau, who's the coach of the Chicago Bulls, who was talked about last time. And despite his name is not from Louisiana, mm -hmm. it's a real Louisiana name, uh, he's, from, uh, he's from Connecticut. And the Bulls got eliminated last night, and there's rumors that he's going to be fired. And he's supposed, supposedly he's a really good uh, defensive um, expert. And so there is some talk that, he, that they'll at least be talking to him. Okay. It is now time to look ahead. Errol, back to you. Well, you know, today you saw the, uh, the verdict on the Boston uh, bomber trial where he got the, uh, the death sentence. And one of the people that testified was Sister Helen Prejean. And Sister Helen, which, which just reminds me that Sister Helen Prejean's book, Dead Men Walking, an opera was made into it. And the opera is going to be performing it um, next season. Suppose it's a very good opera, uh, March 4th and 6th okay. next year or so. All right. Thanks, Errol. Jeremy. Louisiana legislators keep saying that everyone needs to take a pay cut, uh, take a haircut to, to help balance the budget. Well, I'm wondering what about their budget? Are they willing to, to cut their own budget? Representative Pat Connick out of Jefferson Parish will have an amendment next week to cut a million dollars. Will anyone else step to the table to, to cut more? All right. Catherine? Well, I'm heading to San Antonio next week. There is another hearing in the ongoing legal saga with Tom Benson and his family members. This one is over. Um, whether a federal judge or a, a Bayhar County um, probate judge should hear the, the case that's going on in Texas. Okay. We'll be looking for that. Thanks, Catherine. David? I learned my lesson last week when I promised <laughs> that I'd do something on uh, involving the police department, and I ended up just being completely diverted, so I'm just going to say more Library Foundation. More Library Foundation. <laughs> we, we can look to that. Yes. I can, right? And just, what, a month left in legislature, so it's going to be mm -hmm. hot and heavy four weeks coming ahead. Uh, budget passes on, is supposed to pass out of the House on Thursday. That will leave three weeks left. Okay, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you all so much for joining us. And, of course, we want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Thank you.